Hello, everybody. So good to be able to be with you on this great Wednesday night. What a blessing. Thank you for coming to church today and for opening your hearts up to what God is going to have to say to you in this great service. I know you've already been blessed by the praise and the worship and all the things going on here at our church. And I just want to say thank you for, for your faithfulness, for your generosity, for your love, your support, and for being here and coming ready to honor, worship God. And tonight, I've got a great, great teaching to share with you. A teaching that, quite honestly, I don't think we hear enough about. I want to talk to you tonight about, in your life, choosing joy. In your life, choosing joy for your life. Now, we hear a lot about joy. We hear a lot about it in our, in our world. We hear a lot about it maybe in our homes. We hear a lot about it, about it at church. But I've discovered in my own life that oftentimes our using of a word and understanding how that word applies to us and how we apply it to our lives and walk in the power of it, not just the head knowledge of it or the concept of it. You know, we don't, we don't just want that, right? We don't want to be hearers of the word or we understand the word, James said, and yet we don't apply it to our lives. And a lot of times people don't apply it, I think, simply because they don't understand it. You know, it's an interesting thing in, in, our, in our relationship with God's word is that we use words that are not necessarily unique to scripture. Those words are used in every area of life, joy being one of them, love being one of them, all right? And, and we hear the word love, that God is love, or that we are to love one another, or that joy, Galatians said in, uh, Paul said in Galatians 5, is a fruit of our spirit. He said the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith, against such there is no law. But right there at the front of the list, we see love. Well, we know that God's love is totally different. Same word, love, that we use for, I love my spouse, I love my kids, I love hot dogs, I love trucks, I love the cowboys. Well, maybe not. But, you know, uh, you know we, we have this word that we use, but we know, don't we? We know that when we look at love in the context of Scripture, that, it, that though it's the same word, the meaning is much different. Can I hear a good amen on that? And so the same thing is true with peace and the same thing is true with joy. Now, if you have your Bible with you, I want you to turn with me to what may be one of, well, I think you can take the word maybe out of it, one of the most famous verses regarding joy. And it's found in the book of Nehemiah, and I'll give you a chance to get there, right? In my Bible, it's on page 678. That really cleared it up for you, didn't it, right? You're welcome for that timely hint there. All right, but I'll give you a second. You may need to go to the book of contents and then find it and then turn to it. But here in the book of Nehemiah, what has happened is the people under Nehemiah's direction have rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem and have put up the gates again. So now they're, they're, they have an identity. Now they have safety. They have protection. Now they're a community again. They're a family again. They, the raiders of the land just can't come in and take whatever they want. Now they have their walls up. They have their gates up. That's a good thought, isn't it? You know, are my walls up? Are my gates in place? Am I controlling what comes in and out of my heart? Come on, give me a good amen on that, right? Am I controlling that? Well, I'm getting off track, right? I love, how many of you know I love the book of Nehemiah? Also known in El Paso as the book of Nehemiah because I've spent so much time teaching out of it over the years, all right? But what's happened now is the people have finished. They finished it all. And they gather together and Nehemiah and the, other, and the Levites, they've all come and they're dedicating and they're worshiping God. And the people become very, very serious. And, and as they're reading from the law, their hearts get very heavy and they become very convicted because for decades they have not been keeping the law and their hearts become very heavy and very serious, right? And then Nehemiah uh, begins to speak to the people and not only him, but Ezra, the priest and the scribe, you can see it in verse 9, 
begin to speak to them. And they say, okay, you've been taught all this. And the people wept there at the end of verse 9. But then they say to them in verse 10, then he said unto them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send proportions to them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto the Lord, neither be ye sorry. Now that's interesting, right? So here the people have gathered and they have wept because of the conviction of their heart, which there's nothing wrong with that. But then he says, wait a minute, this day is holy to the Lord and it is a day for us not to be that way, not to be sorrowful. He said, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, all of us, I think, want to have strength. Amen to that, right? I want to be strong. I want to have strength. I don't want to be weak in my faith, weak in my love, weak in my convictions, weak in my my character, right? Amen? I want to be strong. And the Bible says a lot about being strong, right? Ephesians, the sixth chapter says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, I want you to notice here, it's very important that you see this. He said, for the joy of the, say it, Lord is your strength. He didn't say joy is your strength. He said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So what is Nehemiah pointing out to us here? What is the Lord saying to you and me in this verse? He's saying to us that this thing called joy, there is a joy that we get. Well, we'll talk about in a moment from circumstances and situations and things around us. Great, wonderful. But he said, just like there is a love that is of God, and then there's the love of, of natural Right, Just like there is peace that comes from natural and there's peace that comes from God, amen, right? Well, there is a joy and there is a joy that, that is the joy of the Lord. And that joy of the Lord is your strength. Not just joy. Okay, again, we're going to talk about it, but I want you to think this way now. I want you to focus on we need to learn about the joy of the Lord. And what does that mean? What does he mean when he says the joy of the Lord? What, 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 what does that mean? Well, the first thing I want to focus on, I want to say to you, <clears throat> excuse me, before we go any further, is that I believe the joy of the Lord comes from our place in him. That we are in relationship with the Lord. That we go through life as children of God, that I am not just Charles who knows about God. I'm not just Charles trying to please God. I am Charles that is in Christ and Christ is in me. You are in him, right? Paul said in Acts 17, in him we live and move and have our being. So this is a constant struggle in our Christian life is living our life to where we are living it in him, living it conscious that we are in him and he is in us. And the world is constantly trying to pull us back into our world, into our lifestyle outside of Christ, our thinking outside of Christ, our believing outside of Christ. When the scripture instructs us multiple times to live in him. In him we live. I, I want you tonight, if you haven't been thinking about that, to purpose to start really focusing on that every day. Would you do that? Start focusing on that. That in him I live. In him I go to work. In him I live in this house. In him I come to church. In him I I live, I move, I have my being. Because there is life in him that is much more valuable, profitable, beneficial, powerful than life as a mere man, as Paul wrote in Corinthians. Are you with me so far? All right, so he says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So again, interesting verse. And here he tells the people 
that joy, this joy in the Lord gives your life strength. So after repentance, get ready, there should come joy, right? Christianity is not all, I'm so no good, I'm so no bad, I'm so wicked, I'm so evil, right? It's not all that. Yes, there's a place for that, absolutely, where we confess our sins, where we see our weaknesses, where we admit our need of a Savior, amen, to where we are in that place where we need this and we want that and we see our failure. But Christianity is not staying there. It is coming there and moving on, amen, moving into the love and the forgiveness and the acceptance of God in your life into his family. And then with that comes this joy of the Lord, a joy that is in our lives because we are in relationship with the Lord. Did you write that down? It is a joy that, that is released in our lives because we are in relationship with the Lord and that we are in him and in him we live and move and have our being in him, in him. In him. All right. So this joy of the Lord gives us strength. Now we know, right? We know, I think we know from many verses, John 10, 10, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. We know that God wants his children to have a life that we enjoy a life, right? Peter said that, that, that when you, you do the things that he said to do six things there in Peter right, that you'll have a long life full of good days. Some of you remember that in the literal text, it says that you'll have a long life full of days you love, full of days you love. I love that verse, right? I confess that verse almost every day, that God is going to give me, my family, give us long lives full of good days, full of days where we have the time of our life, one translation says. Wow. Wow. So those are days where there's joy in them, right? Wouldn't you agree, right? If you're having a day that's the time of your life, a day that you love, well, it's a day that you're going to have joy in, right? A joyful day. So we know that God wants us to, be, to live in that, but we've also got to draw that line and understand that there's a difference between the joy of the Lord that we choose and joy that comes from the flesh or from circumstances or situations. And there is a joy that comes from those things. No question about it, right? No question about it. birthday parties, Christmas, I mean, promotions, great vacations, seeing beautiful things in your life. Yes, all there is a joy that comes from that. But that joy, that joy can also be taken from you. You can lose that joy. Let the circumstance change, amen, right? And that joy is gone. You can't find it. But there is a joy of the Lord that gives you strength in the good times, in the hard times. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah for that. There is a joy that comes from knowing who you are, what you are, what you have, what belongs to you in the Lord, that is yours every day, all day, all the days of your life that belongs to you, that the Lord wants you to have. Now, the world has a view, the world system that we live in has a view of what produces joy. And I jotted down a couple things here, right? It focuses on self-gratification. Well, if, if that happens for me, then I'll be happy. I'll have joy. I'll be glad, right? If the circumstance is good. A lot of times it's cheap thrills. Sometimes it's, it's, it's uh, you know, what it produces in us is a constant search for new experiences, new excitement, new relationships. And this obsession, if we are not careful, can enslave us. All right, if you have your Bible there, turn with me to 
Proverbs chapter 21. Let me show you a fascinating verse that speaks to this. Are you glad you came so far today? Right? It's good, huh? Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 17. He says, he that loves pleasure, wow, shall be a poor man. He that loves wine and oil shall not be rich. So he, he warns us about this love of pleasure, love of self-gratification, love of I need this to make me happy. I've got to have this environment. I've got to have this. Now, again, I'm not saying that, you know, there aren't things in this world that produce happiness or gladness from the circumstances. But my family, come on, there's got to be something more then the only time I can be joyful is when everything around me is gratifying to me. What about those times in life where, quite honestly, the circumstances suck, right? They stink. So there, are we destined then to be weak? We're destined then to have to surrender? Are, are we destined then to try to uh, somehow survive that and get back into a pleasant environment where we can have joy again? No, no, no. There is a joy that is of the Lord. There is a joy that I want you to decide to choose that you're going to choose that is a joy that comes from God. It is a joy that comes because you know that no matter what the circumstance you're in, God is always on your side. God is still in love with you. You are his child and if God be for you, somehow, some way, he's going to make a way. And even though these things going on are not what you would choose or pick, anybody know what I'm talking about? Right? Been there several times. Right? But even in the midst of that, guess what? You can choose the joy of the Lord. I still know who I am. I still know that God is on my side. I still know that no matter what's going on, hallelujah, somehow, some way, God's going to make a way. And I choose that source of joy, not the source that comes from self-gratification or from pleasant circumstances. I enjoy that joy when it comes, that kind, but I don't look to that for strength. I look to the joy that comes because of knowing who I am and where I am and in Him I live and move my being. In him, I am a child of God. In him, I, I have been forgiven. Does that make sense to you, right? Luke, the eighth chapter. Huh? Let's go look at that. Luke chapter eight. Jesus speaks to this. It's good teaching. Valuable. Powerful. Luke chapter eight. Look with me down to verse 14. And Jesus said, and these are they which fell among thorns, such as, as they which, having heard, go forth and are choked with the cares of this world and the riches and the pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. So here he warns us again, right, about this obsession that if you're not careful, we have about the things of this world. And, and that in fact, those things, this, this world thing, this love of pleasure can choke the word of God and cause it not to produce this very strength that God wants us to have that comes from joy, right? So we need to be on guard. We need to be careful for that, right? And not place everything, all the emphasis on carnal things or earthly things or fleshly things. And again, I'm not saying, right, go enjoy birthday parties, go get that new purse, go whatever, right? But don't think that that is the end all for joy. It's not. It's not. Because if you lose that purse or when that party's over, right? Well, if I just got a new house and I'll be happy. Well, pretty soon the new house is the old house. How many of you know what I'm talking about, right? Well, if I just get that car, yeah, in, two, in three years, you're going to be tired of it. All of those things produce a temporary joy. I'm talking about an eternal source of joy that comes from you focusing wholeheartedly on who you are in Christ, that you are a child of God, 
that you are accepted, you are forgiven, and nothing can separate you from the love of God that's yours in Christ Jesus. Amen. All right, let's continue on. All right, now, let me give you a couple of definitions. Are we good? All right, here we go. Dictionary definition of joy. The passion or emotion excited. I like that. The passion or emotion. So there is a feeling to joy. I like that. Right? The passion or emotion excited by the acquisition of the expectation of good. It's kind of a wordy definition. Plainly put, it simply means that there is a joy because we, as children of God, God has given us a hope and a future. And the word hope means the expectation of acquiring good. Right? So I may be in a situation where the circumstance at that moment is yuck. All right, but I have a future and I have a hope. And that hope tells me that there's good out there for me to expect, right? And it will produce in me this excitement, this emotion of joy because of the expectation of good. Don't let anybody rob you of your hope. 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 Am I getting through to you? Hey, have I told you? Don't let anybody rob you of your hope. Your expectation of good. Let's continue. That excitement of pleasurable feelings, which is caused. So pleasurable feelings, which is caused by success as in being according to God's divine principles. So there's a joy, he says, that comes to us as we apply God's principles to our life. And we see those principles produce success. They work. They produce. Right? Things happen. He said, you know what? There's going to be a joy that comes from that. So as I do the Word of God in my life, as you apply the Word of God to your home, to your marriage, to your career, to your health, it's going to produce success, and that success is going to produce joy in your life. Wow, I'm not sitting around waiting for the circumstances to change or I get invited to a party to get joy. No, I'm going to get joy from being a doer of the words. Anybody know what I'm talking about tonight? I bet you do, right? That comes to you and you go, wow, right? And you get excited. Yes, because you have seen the word of God produce in your life. I love this definition. Can you tell? Right? Now, the joy of the world will pass with the world. Well, what do I mean by that, right? When the circumstances of the world change, well, then that, those things change. You know, I, I'm, as I say that to you, I think about back in the Great Depression. You know, on that Monday when the stock market collapsed, on Wall Street in New York City, there are pictures of men literally jumping out of the buildings and committing suicide. Amazing. Because just a few days before that, they were enjoying their wealth. They were enjoying, they were happy. But when the world system passed, their joy passed too. I don't want that. I don't want my ability to be glad in life to be tied to the world. Now, I want to enjoy those things when they come, those pleasant moments. Beautiful. But that's not my source, right? And that's not what's going to give me strength. That gives me enjoyment in that moment. But strength comes from knowing who I am, where I live, who I am, that I'm in relationship with God, and nothing can separate me from that. And that relationship with God has give me, given me an expectation of good, a hope and a future. Am I getting through to you tonight? All right? So, we want to have that, right? We don't want the joy that is temporary. We want the joy that is permanent. The temporary joy is rooted in circumstances. The permanent joy is rooted in your relationship with Jesus. In your relationship with him that you focus on and, and renew your mind to the reality that you belong to him and he belongs to you. Amen. All right. Let me give you some definition. All right. There's a couple of different words used in the Bible for joy. So I'm going to give you the definitions, all right? The first one means to be filled with intense joy, physical comfort, and well-being. The basis of this joy is to be rejoicing over the mercy and grace of God working in someone else's life. Wow. 
Let me say that to you again. So there is a joy. The joy of the Lord is activated in our lives when we see and we are grateful for the mercy and grace of God working in someone else's life. Working in someone else's life. You know, when you think about all of the great things our church does is an expression of God's grace and mercy to other people. All of our classes, all of our things that we do, all of our outreaches, our food programs, our clothing, our backpacks, our toys, the thing we did at the senior citizen centers a couple of weeks ago, all of the other things I do, our food pantry, you know, the, 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 the ministry that we do, all of that. And it produces what it is, you know, we see these people and we see the impact in your life. You know what gives me joy is hearing your testimonies, hearing what God's word has done, seeing the mercy mercy and grace of the Lord working in your life. That gives me joy. And it's not the joy that comes from circumstances. It's the joy that comes from the Lord. Are you getting this? And God wants all of us to experience that. I pray that you are rejoicing when you think about all the things that our church is doing in our community, in our world. Right? As an expression of God's grace and mercy. Number two. Right? There is a joy that comes from being around in in festive company. I, You know, one one of the things that kind of shocks, let me tell you a little secret. Some of the super religious people, you know, they, they come here for like part of a service and they leave. And one of the things they complain about is that it's too happy here. It's too happy here. Pe- people, people are too happy here. They're, 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 they're having too much fun. By golly, they're just having too much fun. You know, we did the big kids camp a week or so ago, and hundreds of kids came, and hundreds of kids accepted Jesus the Lord. And you know what? I heard a few complaints. Heard a few complaints. Well, you know, we, we, you know, that, you know, it's just not all about having fun. By golly, it's just not all about having fun. Right, 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 right. Why, 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 why do you want to be that way? You know, when God told Solomon to build the temple, he said, it must be festive. It must be festive. God wants us to come together and have fun. What's wrong with us? You know, you can have fun at your grandparents' house, fun at your uncle's house, fun at your house, but you're not supposed to have, not supposed to be happy when you come here. No, no. There is a joy that comes in being among festive companies. What the Bible says. Number three, there's a joy that comes when you experience public worship. There's a Greek word for that word, right? A joy that comes from being in public worship, from being among us in public worship, all of us gathered together in, in both locations, right? Worshiping God together. I, I tell you, it fills my heart with joy. You may see me. I'll be sitting down front and I'll turn around and look back at the congregation. Why? Because it fills me with joy. It fills me with joy to see so many people here clapping, lifting their hands, singing, Right? Even those of you that just kind of stand there. But you know what? You're here. Hallelujah. Right? A lot of you are smiling. And it just touches me. Right? That is, there's a joy that comes from being in public public worship. Right? And the Bible says, where we are rejoicing, we are overflowing, we we are adoring, we are honoring, we are glorifying God, we are boasting about Him. And we, are, and we are jubilantly rejoicing. Isn't this good? It's really powerful, isn't it? Huh? That joy, this joy of the Lord is activated that way. Now, in closing, I've got six minutes left. I want to give you some things that I found is kind of a foundation for biblical joy in your life. Four things that if you think about and you kind of make a part of your meditation on a regular basis will really build the room of joy in your house. All right? Number one. Number one. Right? Turning to God and putting your trust in Him. Turning to God and putting your trust in Him. Well, Charles, I, I, I can't seem to find the Lord. Well, not to sound like a smart aleck, but I'm going to sound like a smart aleck. Who do you think moved? (laughs) Uh, He didn't, right? 
No, I did. You did. Huh? We need to remember why we're coming to church. Huh? We're coming to church to rejoice. We're coming to church to be glad. We're coming to church to be encouraged. We're coming to church to encourage others. We're coming to church so that he might strengthen us. Amen. So that we might mount up on wings as of eagles. Right? That's all strength. And it comes from this rejoicing that we get. Beautiful. Number two, right? Number two, right? To, to see God's open door for your life. To see God's open door for your life. A door of welcome, a door of enter, a door of come in and walk through it. Not to stand out here and say, I don't deserve it. I don't belong. You know, God should be mad at me. No, the door is open. Walk through it. Walk into your father's presence. Walk into your father's reality. Walk into being a doer of the word and not a hearer only. And watch the word begin to release its power in your life. Right? To walk through it. What do I mean by that? Accept the lordship of Jesus in your life. Quit resisting. Quit being rebellious. Quit quit refusing to walk through the door of obedience and submission and surrender. But walk through it and make the lordship of Jesus have power in your life. Right? Number three, understand righteousness. Right? That you have been gifted. Everybody yell, gifted. I couldn't hear you. Everybody yell, gifted. You have been gifted with righteousness. Right standing with God. The right to come before God without guilt or shame. Why? Because of you or me? No, because of he that sits at the right hand. Because of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's focus on that right standing, that we have right standing. And as a result, we have the right kind of convictions. What do I mean by convictions? Right? That our focus is on the right things. That what should be important to us is important to us. And what shouldn't be on our radar is off our radar, right? And that we are standing in that righteousness, that we are seeking first that righteousness, Jesus said in Matthew 6, right? That we have right standing with God, amen? And that, and that we are participating in that righteousness and standing in it, all right? The next one is that we understand, look, look with me to Romans, the 14th chapter. This is a heavy verse, okay? I'm going to warn you before we read it. Romans 14, very, very powerful verse. Romans 14, okay? Verse 7 and 8. Paul writes, for none of us lives to himself. None of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or we die, we are the Lord's. So I found in my life that focusing on that, that my life is hid in him. My life belongs to him. And whether I live or I die, I'm not here by myself. Everything is being done unto him. And everything is done in him. And everything is there, all right? And we stand in that place. Amen. Stand to your feet with me. I want to pray with you here before we're done. I want to talk, pray with you tonight about choosing the joy of the Lord, right? I want to choose to be joyful, excited, amen, glad, happy, not because of circumstances, but because of relationship. Lift your hands towards heaven with me. Both campuses. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person here tonight. And Lord, tonight we choose your joy and your strength. We choose it. Say it out loud with me. Say it now. I choose the joy of the Lord. Again, I choose the joy of the Lord that I have because of my relationship 
with you, Lord. And I thank you. In you, I live. Come on, keep saying it. In you, I live. I move. I have my being. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Now, one of our pastors is going to come up and talk to you about the rest of the service. Love you. See you this weekend. It's going to be a great time. God bless. Go out and be joyful.